Mr. Eric Howley. Thank you for doing this. You bet. The first question I always start with is, what was the role of music in your childhood? Interesting. Um, you know, I was a sports kid. I was a baseball kid. I was, you know, a pitcher and, you know, and, uh, you know, thought that, you know, eventually I would try and become a pro baseball player. And my dad was very excited about that. <laughs> and then at 13, um, you know, I had some buddies that were playing guitar and I would go to their house. They had their parents were in the music industry and I grew up in Los Angeles and, and their parents were in the music industry and they had a studio in their backyard. And, uh, you know, we would go and hang out there and they would have studio musicians coming in and out of there and they'd let me sit in on sessions and just kind of watch and see what's going on and stuff. And so it was, it was, it kind of got me excited about music and, you know, and at that point it was, you know, rock and roll, it was Led Zeppelin, it was the Beatles, it was, you know, a lot of the British rock, you know, music and stuff that, you know, Jimi Hendrix and, you know, and Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and all those guys got me real excited about playing guitar and being a musician. And um, so from the time I turned 13, I got my first guitar and started playing. As soon as I started playing guitar, I never played baseball again. It was over. <laughs> We're lost to the major league. Yeah, yeah. Didn't quite make it there, but... <laughs> was it always a plan to be... to focus on, on studio work, on being a studio musician, since those were the people that sort of were your way in? Mm -hmm. Was that also where you go, that's what I want? Yeah, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, of course, every kid wants to be in a rock band, you know, but as I got a little bit older and, you know, when I graduated from high school, I was really listening to a lot of the studio players in Los Angeles, and there was a place called the Baked Potato Club that I could go to and hear, you know, all the best studio musicians, you know, Mike Landau and Steve Lukather and all the Toto guys and everybody, they would play at this place, and we could go down there, and the place was like as big as this room, it was tiny. And you go and you're sitting in this tiny room and the most amazing players on the planet are playing, you know, this unbelievable music and just, you know, watching them play their guitars and listening to them, their tones they're getting from their guitars. It was so exciting. And, you know, and they would talk about, oh, I was playing on a Lionel Richie record today and, you know, tomorrow I'm playing on a Rod Stewart's record. And I was like, man, that is so cool. You know, these guys, like, they're totally unknown to the rest of the world, but to musicians like me, they were the heroes. I bought those records because those guys were on those records, you know, and that to me was like, you know, that's the stuff, you know, that's what I really dig is, you know, these, you know, if, you know, Steve Luca there was on the record or Mike Lando was on the record, I would just buy it, you know, because I know there's going to be something great on there and I'm going to learn whatever it is that they played. And so, yeah, that, you know, by the time I graduated from high school and started in college, you know, that was kind of my thing was like, yeah, I want to be a studio musician and Growing up in LA, a lot of what studio musicians do, you're either like a guy that plays on the records or you're a guy that plays on TVs and movies. And so I really kind of prepared myself for either way. I wanted to be like a guy that could do either one. You know, if one of them worked out, cool. If the other one worked out, cool too. And so when I was at, I went to USC and I was studying at the US, uh, University of Southern California Studio Guitar Program. And, um, and I was studying with, Steve Watson, who was, you know, playing on all the Mike Post TV shows and, I mean, like A-Team and uh, Hill Street Blues and, you know, Quantum Leap and, you know, all those shows, he was the guitar player on those shows. And so, you know, we would have a, a lesson in the afternoon and he had been there for a 9 or 10 a.m. session and, um, you know, he would bring me the charts. He said, this is what I had to do today, so this is what you have to do today. And I'm like, okay, cool. So, I, and I really got into it, you know, because here I'm studying with this guy that, you know, is doing it. You know, he's doing all the stuff that I dream about doing, you know, and they have, you know, all their impressive, you know, gear that they would have delivered and they'd play on these TV shows and, and Carl Verheyen and Richard Smith and all these guys that, you know, that I was studying with, they were all amazing session players and they were playing on TV shows and, and doing a lot of those records. So, um, you know, I was like kind of gearing myself towards doing that and, and um, at, while I was at USC, they have a, a film scoring department there. And so I kind of got in with some of the film scoring guys that were learning to be, you know, the next, you know, guys that were going to be, you know, um, you know, scoring movies. And, uh, and I started doing some of their sessions for them. And this one day I was <laughs> going up to the Disney studio in Burbank and, you know, I got caught in traffic. It, would, it never rains in Los Angeles, but it rained this day. 
and it just happened to be like the worst possible day that it could rain and of course you know the traffic didn't move at all and so I was sitting there for about two hours and moved about five miles down the freeway and never made it to the session and that was a very pivotal moment for me because I was like okay this is like the beginning of my career as a session musician. I've already blown it because, you know, I didn't make it to this session and it was, you know, because of traffic. Do I really want to deal with that? And at that point, you know, it was very soon after that that I discovered that Nashville, Tennessee had an amazing session world here too where there's a lot of guitar players making a living playing on records. And so, you know, I had a couple of friends of mine that had inspired me and talked to me about, hey, you got to come to Nashville, come to Nashville. So I came and checked it out and I loved it. And... I've been here now for 20 years. That, that Next so month fun. will be exactly 20 years. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to have a party. I we will. A, a Nash-versary party. Exactly. Um, besides, because we've talked about this a lot, the, the insane talent pool that is here in studio musicians, and they walk in, you play them a song once, and they can play it back to you. It's right. crazy. So besides talent, which obviously, yes, what other qualities do you think are really essential to be able to work at this level if you have plans to come here what are the other things you should be cultivating well there's a big difference between here and los angeles and i was kind of gearing myself up to do things the way that they do in la because in la they you show up to a session and they have they know exactly what they want you to play and they have it written out and you have to be able to read those notes and you have to be very good at sight reading music because you know a big part of that that gig is not only having the sounds, but being able to sight read these notes. And it's like, it's pretty intense, you know, what they, what they want you to do out there. But here in Nashville, the thing that's different is that, you know, we use a number system here, you know, for the charts. And it's not the same as, as reading actual music notes. It's, you know, it's a number system for the chords. And the difference is, is that Nashville musicians are really required to start coming up with their own parts. You know, that's what they expect of you. When, when you get hired to play guitar on a session, they're wanting you to come up with your own parts. You know, they'll give you a, a number chart, you know, that tells you what chords are going on there. And, and you know, and they'll get a good idea about what the feel is going to be for the song. And then they may say, okay, we want, you know, some guitar signature lick. And you got to come up with it right there. You know, so that's pretty intense. You know, I mean, that's like you know, okay, we don't have time to work this out because they don't give it to you beforehand. You just show up and they like, okay, here it is. And that's where I think the talent pool is different from Los Angeles to Nashville is that the Nashville guys come up with stuff on the spot. They don't have the option of like, oh, okay, well, here are the notes that they want me to play and I know exactly what it is. No, this is like, you know, it's probably even a little bit more challenging because you have to come up with, if you're doing a record date and you're playing you know, a 10, 2, and a 6, and you may be playing like three songs for each session, you got to come up with signature licks that are different, that don't sound like you just played the same one, you know, it's like, so you got to come up with stuff that's very different for each song, and that makes it its own thing, and you're almost kind of like, you know, a composer slash producer, you know, the player's you know, are kind of helping the writing or producing process, you know, because some of these signature licks that are so integral to the song, you know, like Chattahoochee or something like that, you know, it was like, you know, Brent Mason came up with that, you know, and it was such an integral part of the song. I, I felt like, you know, you got to give him a writing credit on that, you know, because that was pretty amazing, <laughs> you know, because that song would not have been the same without that guitar lick. And so I think that's the difference between Nashville players and L.A. players is that, you know, what they are asked to do is very different. Not that the LA guys couldn't do that, they can, but that's not normally what they're asked to do out there. Mm -hmm. And then kind of in the similar vein is the songwriting. Um, I think I think it was a, a James Taylor show, he was you know playing Nashville, <clears throat> and he said it's intimidating to play Nashville because it says it's the only city where the audience is more talented. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah, but you have Steve Gadd, so shut up. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> then there's that. Yeah. And Mike Landau. <laughs> we don't, exactly. It's like, we don't have these people, so yeah, be quiet. Right. Uh, but I think that's, that shocks a lot of people. Um, so when you first moved from being a musician to bringing the songwriting into mm -hmm. what you were doing, which you almost have to do if you're going to do anything yep. in Nashville. That's very true. How intimidating was that initially? It was intimidating and inspiring. It all depends on how you look at it. For me, I looked at it as being inspiring. Like, I was like, you know, I would go to, like, when I first came here, 
Um, and I was visiting. I hadn't even moved here yet. I went to Douglas Corner with some friends of mine. They said, we got to go to Douglas Corner. And it was Daryl Scott and Susie Ragsdale and Verlin Thompson, oh, you know, doing this round. And I was like, I'd never seen a round before. And it's like, you know, three amazing songwriters that, you know, sing great. And they're all singing on each other's songs. And they're like, all right, you sing your song. All right, you sing your song, you know. And they're all like amazing, you know. And then, you know, you just start, you know, you realize that, okay, the songwriting thing is a whole nother level here, you know, because it's, you know, in other cities, you know, I don't think that the lyric is quite as important as it is here, you know, and that I think was what sets apart Nashville songwriters from everywhere else in the world is that to us, we have such a high standard for lyrics and the, the, it has to be a clever lyric, it has to make you cry, it has to make you laugh, it has to whatever, you know, it has to move you somehow or another where, you know, in a lot of the pop music stuff, it's, you know, the beat and the, you know, the groove and stuff like that is more integral, you know, and, and the music side of it. You know, and that was the one thing that I really had to learn when I first got here was that the lyric is super important, you know, because I come up and I go, oh, this is a great guitar riff. And I come up with this great musical stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but your lyrics, they're not so good. So, you know, you got to work on that, you know. And so I fortunately, you know, was super, super lucky because I got to, you know, play in band of probably and and still to this day my favorite songwriter Jeffrey Steele you know and, and Jeff is you know he taught me so much about being a songwriter and you know I would play in his band and and the great thing about that was like you know I mean the guy would write 10 songs a week you know and he would like all right here's the songs I wrote this week and you know, let's learn them for that next show we're playing at Douglas Corner at Third and Lindsay or whatever so we'd do these shows at Douglas Corner and Third and Lindsay and all the songwriters from town would come to check out what he's doing because he's the hot guy in town. You know, he's getting all the big cuts and the big singles and, and everybody's like, I want to know what he's doing and because they know that he's going to play some stuff that's coming up that's been cut that hadn't come out yet and so they want to, you know, get in on the front end of that stuff. And so it was fun being in his band because, you know, every week it was like, you know, songwriter one class, you know, and it wasn't even him, like, teaching me about it. I would just, you know, he'd give me these demos that he did and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to study this. I'm going to learn, like, you know, how you come up with these cool riffs and how you come up with these lyrics. And the thing that he really taught me about was the way you twist these words around, you know, and make, make it interesting. You know, you can't say it the same way as everybody else is saying. You have to find a new, clever way of saying something that's been said maybe a thousand times. And if you can do that, then, you know, your songs are going to get cut. And that was, you know, his thing. And so, you know, sometimes I would go and do these acoustic shows with him where it would just be him and I, and we'd be riding in this truck up to Kentucky or Indiana or whatever, and, uh, and I'd bring a CD along with me of songs that I wrote, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to play him some songs. You know, I'd play him some songs, and he would critique them for me, and he was so great because he was, like, really encouraging as well as, like, okay, here's what, here's what was great about that, and here's what you need to work on, you know, and, and figure out another way of, like, make your lyric more interesting, you know, and, and find a new way, make up words, make up phrases, whatever. And, uh, and he, he really kind of inspired me. And at the time I was out on the road and playing, you know, touring with country artists and I was doing that as a side man and, and really enjoying that. But, you know, he was like, you know what, there's a whole other world that you haven't even tapped into yet. And being a songwriter, you know, can be a lot more fulfilling than just, you know, playing the same 10 songs 200 times a year. You know, which is basically what I was doing. And that was fun for a while, and I enjoyed doing that. But then, you know, I kind of got the itch for, you know, really the creative side of things, you know, because that's really where my heart is, is, is creating and, um, you know, and, and writing these songs and going in the studio and coming up with the guitar parts and all the rest of that stuff. And that's, you know, that's fulfilling on a whole other level than playing for a sold-out arena, you know, where people are going crazy for you. And that's fun, too, you know. But for me now... At this stage of my life, you know, I'm really, you know, having such a great time, you know, working with these, with new artists that are um, trying to find their voice and trying to find their brand and trying to figure out who they are as an artist. And I'm helping them write songs that are going to put them in that, in that direction, you know, as opposed to just writing, okay, well, let's just write some song today. Like, no, we have a mission. We're going to write something that's going to help build your career into something that, you know, is sustainable and that is going to be uh, songs that you can play in a big arena full of people and they're not going to want to go and get a beer when you play it.
or take selfies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time somebody plays a ballad, you know, it's like, hey, they're full of cameras out, and they're taking selfies, and you know, and they're just talking, and they're like, all right. Yeah, I can't, I can't deal with that. That also at the James Taylor show this summer, these two women. Like right in front, you know. Do you realize what talent is like 10 feet away right. from you and you're fussing over your phone? Songwriting royalty. Anyway, <laughs> um, I want to touch on something you just said, a career that's sustainable. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people forget that part. Yep. They're so busy going after what they're chasing and all they can see is that they don't have it yet. Right. But they're never thinking about, well, once you have it, that's when the real work starts. Yeah, exactly. How have you seen that with people you played for or um, artists you've helped the, the trap to not fall into? What would you say that, right. that would be? The first most important thing is stay level and stay grounded. You know, the, the, as soon as you start thinking that this is going to go on forever and, you know, and showing up late for radio visits, showing up late for your concert times, you know, if you're on a tour and they say you start at 7 and you end at 7.20, you better start at 7, you better end at 7.19, you know, or you could be done. And I've seen it happen with artists where they're like, ah, you know, you know, we'll start a little late or whatever. And it's like, it doesn't last, you know, and, and if you start thinking that, okay, I had a number one single or I had a you know, big song and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, you know, I can do whatever. You can't. You have to be concerned about that and you have to treat people right you have to treat the people that are working for you right and all of that stuff I mean you look at the most successful people that have had the longevity in their careers look at George Strait him and his manager Irv Woolsey have a handshake agreement they never sign papers you know the 30 whatever 40 30 years that they've been making records together you know it's they, from my understanding was that they've never had you know and and he has the same guys playing in his band he didn't go you know he got these guys that were helped him get big and help him you know sell out these arenas and stuff like that and go oh well, you know i think next year i'm going to go hire you know some young guys you know a little bit younger and a little bit cooler than the guys no he's got these old guys up there that are just as old as him and they're great. They're great musicians. And, and why would you change it? You know, it's like you've got great guys. Alan Jackson, you know, Kenny Chesney, all these guys have that have had these long, very successful careers. They have that one thing in common. Garth Brooks, you know, is another one who takes very, very good care of his people. The guys that played on his records, the, the guys that played on the first record have played on every one of his records. And the guys that played in his band, I think they're still out with them. You know, I think he's got like his old guys from his band. Most of those guys are back out there on the road with him now, even as in his comeback career, you know? And so that's something that the artists need to learn and they need to understand that, you know, because those things transfer over into other parts of your career. You know, it's like if you start thinking that, oh, I'm a big star and I can just fire this guy, fire that guy, you know, that stuff, it somehow or another, it transposes into other parts of your career to where maybe radio people think that you're cocky and they're like, ah, I'm not interested in this person anymore. You know, or if you come off that way, radio people, you know, they are either in or they're out. And and when you're out, you're out and it's over with. And you can't get them back. Yeah, and you're playing the casino circuit. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't wrong. Which it's is fun, fine. But it's fine, you know, but it's like, and, I, and, and I'm a firm believer that every artist has a window. And your window, you just hope that when that window's open, you better be good to the people that are around you and you better work your butt off as much as you can and don't ever slack off. And, and take care of the people around you. Take care of the people that are taking care of you. You know, you've got crew guys, you've got bus drivers, you've got band guys, you've got management, you've got booking agents that are all out there making this thing happen for you. It's not just you. You know, and you need to always remember that as an artist, that it's not just you. There's a bunch of people pulling strings behind the scenes that are making this thing happen. Your record label, you better be good to those guys because they work their butts off. The radio promotional people at the labels, you know, they make or break your career. You know, if you don't have radio success, you won't have a career. I mean, you can play fairs and stuff like that, and you can play little casinos, but you're never going to have, you know, you know, the big hits on the radio if your label is not behind you and they're not promoting you and stuff like that. And that's such a big part of it that I think that, you know, sometimes after some artists get a little bit of success, and I've seen it happen a lot, you know, they start going, ah, well, you know, 
I'm not so, you know, thankful for my record label anymore. I'm not so thankful for this anymore. I'm not so thankful for my band guys anymore. You know, just be careful. It'll, it'll Definitely. And <clears throat> you mentioned the word, um, even though you said thankful, but one of the things that I always emphasize is gratitude. Gratitude. You have got huge. to cultivate gratitude. Absolutely. Um, for the littlest things, because it's insane what you get to do for a living. When yes. you really think about it. Right. It is completely crazy every aspect that of you it. get to do this for a living. yeah from being a side man to a bus driver to you know doing catering on the road to whatever it's it's still pretty amazing so how do you how do you stay <coughs> conscious of that um because you know it's a career at the other end it's a career same as anything you develop routines you develop get stuck in ruts Right. So how do you stay conscious of, of being grateful for what you get to do? Well, you know, as you know, for my role, I've always been like a guitar player, you know, like a side man for, for artists and stuff. And I did that for a lot of years. <clears throat> and, um, and working as a side man, you're constantly faced with, okay, I got to make sure that I am staying current with my gear, staying current with, you know, my playing ability. And also being cool to the people around you, you know, because when you're on a bus with a bunch of other people, you have to be like, get along and not be like the guy that's leaving stuff all over and being messy guy or being the guy that brings smelly food on the bus. Everybody's like, Oh God, you know, I mean, those are all little things, but they will help to sustain your career in doing that. And, um, um, I think that, you know, the fact that also is that, you know, the way that, artists treat musicians at they're so disposable, you know, helps to keep you grounded also because you know at any point in time, well, they could just replace me, you know, and, you know, there's a bunch of other guys that can play these guitar parts, you know, they're a million super talented guitar players in Nashville. There's no shortage exactly. of really great guitar players in town. So that's always something that can be there. Make sure that whatever it is that you do is super valuable, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you bring into the table is, you know, you're just a great player and a good guy that, you know, is cool to hang out with and make sure that you always, you know, show up on time and, you know, you got to treat it like a job also because it can be really fun and it can be like, oh, well, you know, it's like, I'm just going to act like a rock star out here and it's like, uh, it'll end quick if you do that. <laughs> and we've seen that many, seen many that. times yeah. and we will see that again, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. It has the corollary to this other stuff that people never really think about and that you should, you know, you treat it as a job. Most people will be self-employed at some point and right. are not taking care of their finances. Oh, and I've yeah. seen that go wrong oh, in yeah. horrendous ways. Because, <laughs> yes. oh yeah, money's coming in. I got this, you know, check because I got a cut. Right. Yeah, but you don't know when the next one's going to come. Exactly. So talk a little about how to stay sensible about that. Well, you know, as far as like you know, when, when the money's coming in, you need to invest it properly, you know, and, and be smart about it. Don't go buy things that are going to immediately lose value. You don't go and buy fancy cars and all the rest of that stuff that immediately loses value. What I've done is kind of invested in real estate and, and buying rental properties and things like that. When I was making a lot of money and when I am making a lot of money, it's, you know, I put it towards something that is sustainable, that is something that, because I'm always thinking about my retirement. You know, at some point, you know, they're not going to call me to play guitar for them anymore. They're not going to have me produce the records or write their songs, you know, and, and I need to figure out, I need to have that in place before that happens. So, you know, for me, it's like, you know, rather than going and getting drunk at the bar every night and buying, you know, $1,000 rims for my car, you know, I'm going to put that money towards, um, you know, buying things that, that can actually, you know, have an income for me, you know, purchasing rental properties, you know, or putting, you know, getting your down payment together or live in a place for a while. And once you live in that place for a while, you know, you can eventually um, turn it into a rental property. Like, you know, the, the place that I bought in Green Hills, you know, we lived, I lived there for nine years and then... After that, you know, when we built the house here in Franklin, I kept that place. And rather than selling it, I kept it and rented it out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just keep it moving along that way. So I think that's an important part, you know, that, you know, I think about like if you get a cut and you get a $500,000 check, you could go and buy a $500,000 house, you know, and then that money is gone. Or you could go buy yourself a little $100,000 house and you've got... You know how you know. Say you could live on fifty grand a year. 
you know, how many years could I live on that money and try and get the next cut? You know, rather than spending all that money on one house, you know, what the way that I would look at it is, you know, buy something that's reasonable and suck that money away in case there's a rainy day, you know, and, and, and use that to help to get your next cut, you know, so it gives you that time so that you can not worrying about, okay, not worrying about I got to pay my mortgage payment or I got a car payment to pay. Now I'm focused on, you know, I can just focus on writing my songs and I can stay creative and I can be paying for my demos and, you know, all that kind of stuff and paying Plugger to go and pitch them for me and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, then again, that's investing your money in your career, you know, rather than, you know, buying in a fancy car. Fancy car, fancy house, and all that, and then you got nothing. You're like, oh, okay, well, all that money's gone, but I got this great house, and I'm not sure how I'm going to pay the light bill, but... <laughs> yeah, I have no furniture, I can't afford to eat, but... <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> but thank you so much. Oh, sure. Uh -huh.